ladies and gentlemen, it's the one and only James Williams, Dark Waters from the Dark Waters channel. I am DarkWaters.com, HuntDogMan.com, Dogman Adventures. Guys, y'all know I got websites all over the place. Um, and it's really the Dark Waters Media Group. And I'm back with another exciting episode for you guys for Bigfoot Weekend. Now, if you've been listening to the content, the Bigfoot Weekend, uh, man, you should be just getting slammed all day long with great content. I mean, some of the best field researchers, some of the best encounters that I've done in a very long time as it pertains to Bigfoot, and some of the best concepts and ideas of how to move just the crypto research field a lot further as a whole. With that being said, I'm joined by Pat Squatch this evening, and I'm excited about this conversation, ladies and gentlemen, but let me address something before we get rolling. Some people will sit there and say, well, I can't believe you're talking with Pat, and there was this stuff with dog man cams and all the rest of it. Let me tell y'all something. I grew up in New Orleans, and for me, um, I grew up in an environment where when there was a conflict in any shape or form, um, people came to the table and talked. And sometimes you didn't talk immediately. Sometimes you talk a year later, six months later, three months later. But there was always conversations amongst men. And Pat was one of those people that was open to a conversation. I really appreciate that, Pat, being open to a conversation because it makes it not be personal. It makes it be about something else. You know what I'm saying? When when a person's not willing to even talk with you about anything and you extend the hand and they slap it away, that's making it really personal. And that's the one thing you didn't do. So I want you to know I appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, I honor him for doing that. And that's why he's here. And that's why we're going to have this conversation, because I appreciate men being men. With that being said, Pat, what's happening, baby? What's going on? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing tonight? Um, it's, man, there's all kinds of stuff going on, let me tell you. But uh, I appreciate the words uh, and uh, right back at you, man. Right back at you. So, oh, so I, you, I appreciate it as well, man. Mm-hmm. No, awesome sauce, brother. Well, let's start here. I'm going to hit you with the standard question, but my standard question is not quite so standard. You know, Mm -hmm. in this field, the Bigfoot research field, you know, there's a couple of people. There's different ways they come to the realization that strange, weird, odd things happen. Like most, some people have encounters as children with things in the woods or scary things at home that kind of lead them on this path where they find Bigfoot, Dogman, Cryptids, right? Then there's other people who come into it as adults. And it's through movies, television, or family members and friends. How did you find yourself over in this corner of this weird place of the world? How did you end up being interested in this? Well, uh, I mean, the short version is, um, you know, I do remember seeing the PG film when I was younger. Of course, I mean, a lot of people did. It was in, it was in media, um, uh, because it's was, it was kind of a fascinating film. And and as a kid seeing the PG film and then also pop culture uh, was involved all intertwined. Right. Right. So uh, I remember in particular, you know, $6 million man uh, in, in the Bigfoot episodes, with the right. $6 million man. And, you know, which was Andre the giant and all that, Um, you know, as a very, very young kid, I probably was what three years old when those episodes aired. Um, you kind of confuse reality, sort of like you were saying, you, you set it up that way. Like as a small child, you can confuse reality, uh, with TV or a the- theatrical things. And, um, uh, and that was my introduction to Bigfoot was actually pop culture. Um, anyway, fast forward, you know, uh, throughout the years. And, and of course, you know, knowing of the PG film, watching it many times at different levels of my uh, growth. One day, I just I, I kind of threw in the towel and said, man, I want to know why in the heck people say they're seeing this eight foot tall, you know, eight man thing out in the woods. Um, It's pretty consistent and there's a lot of them. Like, it's not just a handful of people. It's not even hundreds of people. It's like deep into the thousands, even at that point. And uh, and so, yeah, I kind of threw my hat in the ring to say, I, I, I want to know what that's all about. One way or another, I don't, I have no vested interest in what the answer is. In other words, I don't want it necessarily to be one thing or another. Sure, I, I, there's going to be certain biases. Everyone has them, right? But I have no serious emotional investment like, 
hey, if everybody's hallucinating, so be it. At least we got an answer, right? Like that kind of thing. Right. Uh, yeah. So so I threw my hat in the ring and said, all right, I'll take a stab at this. I'm interested and I'll swim these waters, <laughs> so to speak. And, uh, you know, man, that was uh, 15, 20 years ago, really, that I started dipping my toe into the the phenomena is what I call it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, here I am still doing still doing that and that's awesome man i tell you it's amazing the more people i talk to or who are in the cryptids it's a very similar story it's almost like it's a drug once people get on it they can't get away from it they want to keep on researching it i talked to field researchers who've had phenomenal footage of bigfoot dog man and i'm like okay so now you've got the footage now you've got photos what do you do next and he's like i don't think i'm gonna stop i'm like well you know, what's the end game for you? What's your end game as it pertains to this? I don't know. I'm just going to keep on going. I'm like, all right, bro, you know, enjoy it. You know, and that's one of those things when it comes to this topic, it seems like it's a hobby. It's a passion for some people. It's a religion, which that's crazy. I don't do that, but it's right. so much more than just a topic. And when I came into this path, I didn't realize that it was kind of like, yeah, I like it. I want to get into it. It's interesting. It's easily monetizable. Um, but then you get deep into it and you're like, man, for some people, this is way more than just a topic about monsters. They identify self with it in various different ways that, mm -hmm. um, that's hard to relate to. And that's the, that's what makes this field so deep and so rich, but also what makes it so dangerous and so kind of full of conflict as well, because people identify with these, the topic in so many different ways. And I try to relate that to the audiences that listen. So they'll, they'll understand what they're seeing when they see it, because most people don't understand, you know, what is actually happening and what goes on. So, yeah. um, but I, I love it. I'll, I'll tell you, I love it. I, me personally, Pat, I, I can see a point where I transition to my next thing. Um, yeah. but there's so many people who don't see a point where it's like, they won't transition to anything else, you know? And that that's crazy, man. That's absolutely crazy. Oh but man, I mean, I yeah, yeah. I I already have five YouTube channels and and man, I want to create ten more. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, I mean, so like I could I can like bring it in many different ways as far as like what I do and what I like to do. But the Bigfoot thing is is very um it's very interesting to talk about. So so right now that's what I do the most. And yeah, you're right, man. It's with people, it's personal. Like it's it it's personal on so many different levels. There's so many variables of personal. Um, so your your researcher, like you're talking about, who might get out there and find some stuff, but he you know right, he wants to keep on doing it. Man, that's a personal connection. That's somebody that wants to sit around a campfire and wait for something to come in close, right? Right. Um, sometimes I call like that thrill seeking, maybe. Uh -huh. You know, um, I think that's maybe an appropriate word for some, not all, you know, but some, I think some people it's like so personal and, and deep um, that man, they like I know people that are just dying to see one. And to be honest with you, DW, like, I don't get that. I don't get you know? it either, bro. Yeah, because I'm not I'm not dying to go face to face with a Bigfoot, you know, or a dog man or or freaking, you know, like whatever crawls out of the damn swamp in, in the middle of the night that it ain't supposed to be there. <laughs> That's not you supposed know? to exist. I'm with you, bro. Yeah. Or even a bear. Like, I don't want to come face to face with a bear at 20 feet, you know? Um, yeah. So it's personal. I think, I, I think you, you summed it up pretty good, man. <laughs> People it's personal and, and because it can be personal, also, there could be sort of a cherished personal thing going on, which can cause conflict, like you said. Yeah, you know? and that's I think that's where a lot of the conflict comes in this field. It comes to the personal nature of people's beliefs being attached to it. And then the other side comes into the competitive nature of the field. Um, I think sometimes mm -hmm. people don't they don't acknowledge the competitiveness of being a, a what do you call it, an influencer. Um and they, they don't acknowledge it and the want and desire for it, but then it manifests in people's actions. And, um, but all those are things that can be easily dealt with if people talk to each other, you know, and, and if cultures, if the culture of the cryptic community changes, 
I think everybody will see levels of success that um, that will make everyone happy. But that's a that's a shift that's going to take time to make happen. And it will happen. All right. Let's shift off of that. And let's talk about some of the technology. Ladies and gentlemen, let me stop right here and address you. If you are listening to this, I want you to stop what you're doing for a moment. If you're driving, don't stop. But if you're like chilling at home, stop what you're doing for a moment. I want you to kick your feet up. And I really want to have a deep conversation with Pat about some of the things that we could possibly do to actually bring evidence to the table. Um, but this is important for you to listen to because there's going to be a role that the audience plays in any type of project that brings evidence to the forefront. And it has to be a multiplicity, a duplicity of us too. It has to be a conversation where everyone is involved. I didn't use any of the right words right there, ladies and gentlemen, but it has to be a conversation where you and the audience are actually intellectually involved in this as well as us. Because um, at the end of the day, I was talking to a gentleman this morning, Pat, and we were talking about his book. And um, he was like, yeah, man, I was talking to this guy and he told me if he promoted it on my YouTube channel, it would be... Um, a nationwide bestseller because it would sell 10,000 copies in a week. And I told him, I said, well, bro, that's something that the community as a whole should be able to function in all the time. I said, there should be um, a book that hits the marketplace that people from our community are promoted and they hit the, the Amazon, you know, New York Times bestseller list at will because as a collective of audiences, there's nothing that can't be accomplished. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I'm saying this to you because you play an important role in allowing people to accomplish their goals, whether it be by viewing their channel, which helps them monetize it, or whether they're just using encouraging words, which helps them keep going, or whether it be opening up your pocketbook for a little bit of money or, or your wallet, pocketbook wallet, yeah, for a little bit of money to help them out. Pat, I'm thinking, I've heard you hold these conversations, bro, about drones and like using drones to find Bigfoot. And I mm -hmm. think it's an ingenious idea. Um, there was two ideas that I had. When the Dog Man Cam's thing was there, that was the first. The second, what was three? It was then, it was using AI face scanning technology to create an app based on all the faces of Bigfoot that we've already captured, field researchers have captured, like the brow, the nose and upload them into an artificial intelligence computer program. And when the field researcher goes out and he points that camera at the trees, it uses that AI technology to kind of facial recognition to recognize a face that wouldn't commonly be known as a face, right? And yeah. then combining that with drone technology, where the drone has the same thing. And so now your drone is scanning the woods. You know, they're going to look up while you're flying over the woods. And now your drone scans and it gets the face because we have ample photographic evidence of these things' faces. So let's start with the drones. Um, right. Do you think it's possible to do this? Do you think it's possible to actually pull it off just with the drone flights alone? Forget all the other technology crap because that's programming. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to pull it off with the drones? And if so, how? How do we do it? Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty passionate about this. Um, Either I'm right or I'm wrong, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm right that um, if you use advanced thermal drones, and I'm talking advanced, so I'm not talking like, I mean, the, these are like your your starting price is 10 grand for that kind of camera attached to an aerial system. And they are pretty advanced um, that, you know, if you use that technology to look for these things out in the woods, um, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, I'm focused on Bigfoot. I can only look for one thing at a time, you know. Uh, right, but, I'm with you. But hey, whatever I come across in the meantime is what I come across, right? Um, but yeah, if you use this technology to look for them in the places that they would be or could be or should be, um, it's only a matter of time before you get on top of one and get a actual filmed observation that will be a thousand times more powerful than the PG film. Um, just imagine even just a half an hour of observing a uh, Bigfoot out in the woods, you know, would be, I mean, that would be very powerful. You would get all kinds of data. It would be fairly conclusive. 
um, because the drone will tell you, the data will show you it's not wearing clothes. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's 38 degrees outside. Um, it's, you know, whatever, eight feet tall, four foot wide shoulders, the knees not in the right place. I mean, uh, do it's like all the things we look at the PG film and go, man, that's no guy in a suit, but still it's not good enough. What if you had a hundred times better than that? What if you had a thousand times better than that? Um, yeah, if it's done in the right way by enough people in the right parts of the country, it's just a matter of time. And I'm willing to say after a series, if a serious effort was put forth after a couple of years, if there's no good visual conclusive evidence of this creature out there, then they aren't there, bud. I'm willing to throw in the towel and say, I don't know what's going on. I guess they only manifest around people. And that's not a road that I'm going down. So bye. Right. I'm out. You're willing to hang it up. And yeah. you know, when I, when I when I think about it, when I, this was like two years ago. I'm sitting at home smoking a cigar and I'm thinking about um, the drone, the process of using a drone. It, I, all these problems presented themselves to me, right? Like the first mm -hmm. problem was, let's say you take an area, because I was going to experiment with Bayou Sauvage here in New Orleans, which I grew up on the outskirts of Bayou Sauvage. I know there's Bigfoot and Bayou Sauvage. I know the Rougarou is there for sure because we used to see stuff back there as a kid. And I was like, okay, so let's say you had a drone um, that you launched from somebody's rental property, like on the backside of their rental property that goes right over the levee, right over the um, Bayou Sauvage. And it flew a pattern that was pre-programmed mm -hmm. to fly that pattern day and night. Um, it would have to land, charge, dock, charge, and then take off, you know, download the data and then go back again. Because if it goes out over the, the area and something happens and you, you know, you lose it, you lose all the data. So my first thing was like, how do you get that data to a location where it, it's stored every time it takes a flight? And then the other thing was programming it for a pre-assigned pre, pre -assigned track that it would fly. And the other thing, I was like, okay, then the other problem is what height does it need to fly at? in order to make sure that it can't something can't be thrown at it and knocked out of the sky and then all hell breaks loose if it falls and you need to recover it because you they're typically in heavily wooded areas and swampy areas so now i got to go into the damn swamp or into the wooded area where i suspect right. there's big for the dog man to get the camera i mean to get the the actual drone and so those are the problems that i saw with it that made me shy away from it because i was like okay let's say you get all this shit done you got it where it can fly on a certain specific pattern, and, and you know, and it flies a different pattern every day. Um, and if it spots something, it tracks it. Let's say you get all that done, and then they just say, you know what, the hell is that? I'm gonna knock it out the sky, and I gotta go get it. I was like, I don't think I, I don't think I got the balls to go in there and get it, bro. I, I don't think I do. I really don't think I do. So, to me, it was a it's an interesting concept and idea. It's just it has these small flaws. That I think if some if they were worked out, um, like getting a drone is not the problem. Maintaining it and keeping it, that investment of ten thousand, or whether you let's say you lease one, right? Which you can lease them. I talk to people down here. Um, yeah, it's expensive. It's expensive, that, right? Yeah, it's more expensive than buying one. Than buying one, right? I mean, but that's like long term. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was gonna do. I was gonna lease one and try and do it for like a week just to just to do right. it. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, even yeah. in that case. You know, it's, it still presents that problem. Have you it's gone through grand, those problems? Yeah. Uh, so I think I can answer that. Um, it's that, you know, you you just have to you have to have a pilot. Like, so we're not at the point where good advanced thermal drones are like completely autonomous. There's autonomy you can uh, give them as mm -hmm. as a programmer or a pilot. Um, but they're not, no, it's, it's, it is hands-on, it's hands-on work. So there's always a pilot involved as far as the data transfer. Uh, let's just say whatever happens, right. Um, you can transfer that Im imagery, not only to an SD card on the drone, but that, that stream, that data stream that's coming into what you're looking at on your screen as a pilot mm -hmm. can also, also be captured. So, uh, if whatever happens, uh, you know, you you uh, 
crash into a bird and the drone drops out of the sky. Right. But you saw like all this interesting, you filmed all this interesting stuff, right? It, you can capture it on the remote. So, uh, so at the end of the day, uh, it, you know, sucks to lose a drone, but if you captured something interesting and you were recording it on your, uh, on your, uh, your, your command center, let's say where you're flying, actually flying the drone, then you still have the data. Um, okay. yeah. So you don't have to go looking for it. Um, and, uh, the other thing is, uh, I mean, yeah, like, so not really worried about it, uh, knocking it out of the sky that that's sort of a strange concept to me. It'd be kind of high enough to where I can't imagine any real physicality thing. You know, the, the funny thing I always say is, well, what, you know, what's it going to do? Shoot laser beams out of its eyes and shoot it out of the sky, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, it's kind of like that. And then I follow it up with, well, if it does that, I just captured all that on film. So that's pretty amazing, isn't it? You know, like, um, so that's not really an issue either. You're, you're, you're talking a, like a minimum 100 feet in the air. 150 is probably your more your sweet spot. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine anything being able to take the drone out. Um, honestly, you know, uh, like we're pretty good at throwing things. I don't think there's any animal on the planet that could throw things like we throw things. If I put a drone above, uh, uh, I don't know, like, uh, what Pedro Martinez in his prime, no way he could hit it 150 feet above his head, you know? So I'm not worried about that. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I understand your concerns and a lot of people have concerns. The biggest thing I hear DW is, uh, well, they hear it. They'll hear it. And, uh, and I don't get that one either. I'm like, so what, <laughs> you know, like, what are they, again, what are they going to do? Where are they going to run to? Like I, that, that one doesn't really concern me. Yeah. Um, Cause so what you hear it, I'm above you. I'm flying over you. I'm 150 feet above you. I mean, as long as you can't grab a, sp a stick and throw it in the air like a spear and knock it out of the sky, I don't give a damn. Actually, um, it'll force them to move, and maybe you catch more motion or more you action. Catch motion, or, yeah. Or they'll be curious and come out in the open so they can get a good look at it, and you'll get yeah. them. That that one doesn't that one doesn't make much sense to me. But um, yeah. yeah, I'm like, great. They'll look at it. They will get curious, right? And then, then I get a full facial. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like. I, I mean that, you know, in a legit scientific way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, you know, people say they, they'll hear it, they'll run. And I'm like, well, the drone moves 45 miles an hour through the air unimpeded by anything. Uh, then I'll catch us. I mean, I could follow any animal. I mean, I could follow a jaguar running at full stride. Um, so then, you know, then you get into the, well, if they're supernatural, again, I'll catch that on, like, if they if they disappear into their uh, planet Hairtron portal, guess what? I just filmed that. Like, it, it, there's really no negative to any of that. So. No, it doesn't sound like there's a, a, the only negative is how do you protect that asset um, over the course of, you know, let's say 30, 60 day investigation if something goes wrong with that. And I believe that insurance is the solution to that. That's what I, I came up with. Man, it'd be better to buy an insurance policy on the drone, get full coverage on it to where if it crashes or it breaks. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that drone was insurance is a real thing on two fronts. Um to to protect like your vehicle, like you would your like you would your car, right? Just same kind of thing, you know, full coverage on my drone. <laughs> You know, catastrophic failure, whatever, right? Um, and then there's a, you actually, uh, if you're an FAA pilot, you pretty much have to get aviation insurance, insurance, yeah. Which is which is like it's the same. Uh, you deal with the same brokers that would you would insure your your G seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. like your private jet. You know, so uh, that. You, so it's good to get insurance on both fronts, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, protection of the asset is very important. You you wouldn't want to get 
too risky with it. Like, I wouldn't want to fly down into the canopy and risk, you know, losing the drone, even though you could, you know, you could lose a drone in the canopy and, and still recover it and get it repaired. Like, I've seen that happen before. And the, uh, hell, I've done it, bro. Really? I, yeah, I've crashed a drone in the canopy and uh, got it repaired, and it was just fine. So, um, so yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that answered all your questions or it not. It answered a lot of them. I just, it answers a lot of the questions. I just think that for this field, the research to move forward, we have to move away from what people consider to be the existing boots on the ground, man with a camera, walking in the woods, trekking five miles into the swamp, getting sick, um, getting bit by ticks, getting yeah. bit by mosquitoes, because at the end of the day, you have all the technology that you need to achieve this goal. Um, and I just wanted to push a conversation in that manner, because I know a lot of people will listen to me and a lot of people say, oh, that's a good idea. And then there's people who will go ahead and start trying to do it. Um, my only my only concern is if you're able to pull it off, um, and this has been my my overarching concern about the field as a whole. When I ask people what's the end game, it seems to me like there has to be a formal way of presenting evidence. Um, mm -hmm. And I haven't figured that out yet, Pat. You know, imagine this: you you got an unlimited budget. You went out. You got a little command center vehicle, like one of those Mercedes Benz Sprinter vehicles. You can pull it up on the edge of the swamp, launch the drone. You got a bed in there. You got food. You got a fridge. You can launch the drone, fly around all you want from inside the vehicle. You right. capture all this phenomenal evidence. You bring the drone back. Then how is that presented and who is it presented to? Um, because it's I haven't quite figured that portion of it out. It's like people say, and I've talked to zoologists and cryptozoologists, and I interviewed a shitload of people. And when you start talking to them, you say, well, I'll send them certain photos and clearly a Bigfoot face. I mean, clearly a Bigfoot face. And the zoologists will say, well, that's not clear enough. You know, that can be anything. The cryptozoologists will say, yeah, that's clearly a Bigfoot. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out, and it's been boggling my mind, how that presentation and who is it presented to for any kind of validation? You know what I'm saying? Because think about yeah. it like this. The, if it's presented to the audience, there's biases throughout audiences, right? Um, and those biases are magnified by whatever, who's ever most active, whoever talks the loudest, their voice kind of stands out and does stuff with the, with the evidence and sways opinion on the evidence, right? And then we know the scientific community as a whole, unless we got like Bigfoot having sex and babies popping out Bigfoot vaginas, they don't, they not, they're going to ignore it. And then we have cryptozoology, which it's all on board with it. They're fully vested. Have you ever put any thought into how it should be presented a and lot. where it should be presented? A lot of thought. And so I'll I'll lay that out out on you, man. Um so let's say tomorrow night I you know go out on a mountaintop here in North Georgia, um, where I live, and where the canopy's down, so I have a clear view of the ground. This is very important with the tactic. Um uh and I get a 30 minute observation. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I film one individual on the ground bipedal with an advanced thermal drone. I'm taking that footage. Here's what I'm not doing, DW. I'm not going to YouTube with it. I'm not going to Facebook with it. I'm not going, oh my God, look what I got. Look what I got. I'm taking that to nothing but the right professionals and I, and, and some, some of these professionals will be in the scientific community for sure. Um, and people I trust, uh, there may or may not be NDAs involved. Like this is how powerful I think this will be. Mm -hmm. Um, so there may actually be NDAs involved, especially if, uh, if, if some of these people have to show it through like what we're doing right now, you mm -hmm. know, over the, over the uh, interwebs, right? Right. And um, yeah, and so I'm bridging that gap by giving them something that is going to be extremely compelling observational footage. Again, 
with an advanced thermal drone, you can tell this thing ain't wearing no clothes. It's easy to tell when something it is it's a person right wearing clothes very easy to tell obviously bigfoot they don't wear clothes right. um i'm not exactly sure how that's gonna like pan out with their you know they're very hairy and so what that signature will look like but i can tell you this it won't look anything like a dude walking around in the woods wearing clothes um again it, this is probably cold weather uh 30 minute in the middle of nowhere, so there's no trails over here. There's no roads, nearest roads over there. I mean, all the data will add up to where you have something a hundred to a thousand times more powerful to look at than the PG film. And I know primatologists who think the Patterson Gimlin film is interesting. Like they don't just flippantly say that, oh, that's a guy in a suit. They're they're compelled by that, and that was fifty four years ago, something right. like that. No, shoot, more than that, fifty five, fifty six years ago. Um, so what I'm talking about is very compelling footage that you can take to the right kind of professionals to get the ball rolling on the next level that needs to happen. Worst case scenario, it compels more funding. And more interest from professionals, right? So then that starts stomping on the territory of the boots on the ground guys that love to do this as a hobby or trying trying to get that next PG film themselves, boots on the ground. So now we start to see that dichotomy play out. But yeah, I think the way to present that footage is uh, is to the right people in a private environment. And eventually, dude, you know it's going to end up in media. Right. Like If it's that good, <clears throat> right, it's going to end up in a documentary or it's going to end up in a special, you know, depending on, you know, like streaming platform or regular TV, whatever it is, right? Like, if it's that good, it's definitely going to go somewhere. It's going to land. And it will be presented to the public, but not first. So that's... That is my kind of well thought out plan that will probably go to total crap if if this ever actually happens to me. But, <laughs> but you asked, and uh, that that's the plan I thought out. Yeah, yeah, that you know the best plans tend to fall to crap once it, once stuff happens. You know, right. and when I thought about it, um, and the first time I had the opportunity to really think about it was when um, Blue got his footage down in Florida of dog man running across his yard and it hit Facebook and everybody went crazy. And he and I are talking and I said, well, man, I said, blue bro. I said, stop. He was like, these people want me to do an interview. I said, stop doing fucking interviews. I said, this is what you do. I said, um, for your protection, this needs to go into the media because you're dealing with something that's just ridiculous. I said, it needs to go in the media. So I started kind of plugging him in with a few people in, um, like in like production houses. And then I told him, I said, man, look, call the local media. And he's like, well, I'm scared. So I called the local media. And I was like, I just want you to get covered on this because it was Facebook live. But I'm thinking like, if I was to ever capture something like that, I would have people sign NDAs. I would bring them all in one room at one time. And it would be production houses in there. It would be zoologists, cryptozoologists. Um, it'll be a few people from local media. And I would play the footage and be like, okay, guys, I'm showing this all to you at the same time. And this is what I want to do with it. And I would tell them I want the word to get out about it. Um, but I want it to get out all simultaneously through whatever venues or avenues possible. And then they would all have to launch it all out at the same time. I would flood the airways with that footage. It would be like a coordinated attack. Like you wouldn't be able to deny the fact that, okay, we got something in the woods that's crazy. And that looks like Bigfoot or that looks like a werewolf. Um, because outside of that, all I see is, um, all I see is like different forces, some of them for selfish reasons, other ones that seem like they're coordinated from a, a higher power. They really, I think that really, I've seen enough of that. It seems as if there's a, there's a push to discredit like people's evidence, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and it's definitely a coordinated push. Not people coordinated as in like, oh, this per this researcher versus this researcher. No, there's some other shit going on, Pat. Like I've seen it 
um, across channels, across evidence. And so that's the one thing that concerns me. But what confuses me at the same time is you can go look at the Florida hog hunting regulations and see where they tell you in the Florida hog hunting res- regulations that you shouldn't take a skunk ape or a Sasquatch. So they acknowledge it in hunting regulations in Louisiana and, if I'm not mistaken, Florida. But then there's these campaigns to discredit it on the Internet. That that confuses me. Um, Why? Well, I, I I've seen similar things, and I wonder if sometimes, like, if that is actually reaching some official statement or poster, let's say, or whatever. Sometimes I'm like, I mean, are they just goofing on people? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, we uh, There is precedent for that, where government has sort of thrown out some Sasquatch goofs before. So, right. so that that does make me wonder: is that just a goof, you know? But then there's the other side of the coin: is like, well, are they trying to be serious? I mean, if they put it out there for their own official public consumption, then I mean, they, I mean, they can't hide from that, right? Unless right. it's a goof, uh, you you know what I mean? So they can always doesn't... fall back on it's a goof. You know, and that's what I think. I think it's like I put it out there and I won't fall back on the fact that, oh, that was a mistake. But you put it out there. Um, and what I mean by goof is we're, we're just we're having fun with you. Right. We're just it, we did it for jovial purposes. Right. Yeah. You but that makes I mean? them look even worse, though. You know what I'm saying? It just makes them like they're just trying to make fun of you or we're cracking. Jokes. It makes you look worse. I don't I just that's the one thing. Like, I have a lot of pieces of this puzzle figured out. That's the one piece of the puzzle that does not add up. And I've I've spoken to people who are in, I would consider these guys to be in positions of authority as it pertains to cryptids and monitoring people as it pertains to cryptids. Um, mm-hmm. Coming off of my Coast to Coast interview, and um, everybody thinks it was Siege Lock and Ranches. When I did this story about Dogman Island, which is south of Homa, is when I really started having a few problems. And I was just like, look, dude, I'm just I'm the guy that you talk to, man. I'm a businessman. I'm not the guy that you try and scare. Let's talk. And um, and over time, just holding a few conversations, it's like, man, you're a pretty smart guy. We looked into you. You got this background in engineering. You got this. You got that. And I was like, look, I don't understand what's the point of all this. Like, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. There are creatures in the woods. Everybody knows it. It's clearly there's weird stuff in the woods. Um, what's the point of trying to cover it up or um, or disguise it, and it, and the conversations kept looping back to kind of this. It's not that anybody's trying to hide it; it's just that it's disclosed when it should be disclosed, and it's rolled out the way it should be rolled out. Like some people, like people following a script that they don't have control to edit or do things differently. It's just like, no, it's going to happen in this format over time, as opposed to just dropping it out there. But the technology that's rolled out with cameras and cell phones and TikTok and YouTube and Instagram has completely destroyed any type of timeline that these people had. And I just don't understand why they haven't adapted to that and said, okay, we're screwed. You know what I'm saying? Dude, we're screwed. No, Let's they just, don't, yeah. <laughs> just, we're they done. Don't, they don't adapt to much, man. Like they're slow to adapt, right? You know. But it's stupid. It's just dumb. I mean, it really is. It's dumb. Um, because it's it's not that they're defeated. It's just that you know the plan you had ain't working, and it's just yeah. not working. I, I don't get it, bro. I just don't get it. I, me neither. And I mean, b- boy, you just—I mean, you threw a lot of stuff out there to unpack, uh, which you and I aren't going to unpack tonight. You know, we might we could spend the next you know several months segmentally like unpacking that stuff um you know with me man uh you know i'm pretty pretty much focused on bigfoot uh which is certainly the highest phenomena that i mean it's just so in your face and it's just so like what the hell is going on this i want answers you know and uh and and yeah man it's it, it you know, it's a tough road to navigate sometimes, man. Sometimes, you know, the rabbit hole gets gets deeper, 
right? Yo, you there? Am I there? Yeah, my bad. Yeah, I, yeah, I was yeah. talking. I had the microphone muted because I was lighting my, lighting my cigar. Yes, the rabbit hole does get deep. And inside that rabbit hole, there's holes that run horizontally and you get sucked into them at times when you're talking about this. Um, but I, overall, when you look at the phenomenon of Bigfoot, when you look at the phenomenon of cryptids, in my opinion, there has to be some form of I would call it representation from our community. And I call it a community kind of uh, is what we deal with in the cryptid deal. It's not really a community. It's a bunch of kind of fiefdoms and kingdoms, but there has mm. to be representation from, in my opinion, people who actually love the topic, who are involved in the topic that, that kind of elevates and rises to the top to where those voices speak on a behalf of the different, I'll call them factions inside the community um, that combat some of the other voices that are out there that represent us and misrepresent us all and make us all look like we're freaking retards. Um, and that's one of the things that I've noticed, you know, going to like Comic Con. Now, I'll never forget, I went to Comic Con down here with Dave Schrader and a whole bunch of people. Um, didn't think anybody was going to be there. Ended up being like 200 people in the room. And at first, the first group of people that were there were kind of like, you know, oh, we're going to come see you guys talk about Bigfoot and Moss. And they were real, like, condescending and crazy acting. I was like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. um, and then as more people flooded into the room, I'm sitting there realizing, no, there's some people who have real genuine interest in this. And then at the end, when people start sharing their encounters, I said, okay, these are a lot of people in person giving their own encounters. I need to do an album on those encounters. Um, but they were looking for somebody to represent them as eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. someone to represent them as people who had an interest in this topic, but they, they weren't looking for that representation to come from like a movie production studio. They were looking for it to come from regular people that they seemed to relate to like, okay, you're just like me. You're interested yeah. in this topic. You saw something. And yeah. that's what I'm trying to figure out as well. How do we, how do we get those voices and this is the puzzle I'm trying to fix. How do we elevate those voices of people who are regular Joe Smoes who are in this topic, who have a passion for it, and push them to where they're competing voices with the production houses that are saying, okay, you know, um, mountain monsters. You know what I'm saying? That we know everybody knows mountain monsters is fake. It's highly entertaining. I mean, it really, really is. Like, I can watch that all night long and laugh and joke, but it gives off the wrong perception. Um how do we get to the point to where people from that we know we can touch, we can pick up the phone and talk to get to that point. Um, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we're doing it, man. Like I think it's happening via the internet. Um, and now these, the way that we could broadcast, it was unthinkable 20 years ago. Right. Like unthinkable dude. Right. Like, like, you know, I, I don't even know how else to say it. It was just unthinkable. Um, and, and I mean, you don't need big media to do that. And so, I mean, it's as simple as having, you know, some, somebody like you or me or any of, you know, the other people that, you know, that are kind of doing the same stuff we're doing, having a person on their show to tell their story. Um, and those platforms have existed now for a while, right? I mean, if you look at like at Chronicles and other platforms that do encounter uh, encounter work where they're bringing people on and tell their story and those people kind of feel like it's a safe space to tell their story as opposed to their job or the local bar or wherever, right? Right. So, I mean, we're kind of doing it and we're kind of trying to figure it out still because there's also, you know, it's like what I do is, you know, a lot of serious like discussion or topical discussion and, and we try and keep it real, you know, and, um, it, it, and so because it's the internet, it's all over the map and, and it's, it's sort of a free for all, right? Um, so yeah, I'm not sure like 
I'm not sure exactly what direction it's heading in, but yeah, I think it's coalescing. It's trying to. Yeah. It's trying to. But you know the way I see it, it's kind of like, all right, you got <clears throat> you got people who know this exists, people who understand that these phenomena exist. You have people who are in the middle who experience things in the woods, they block it out. And then you got people who don't believe. For example, I was in Texas, had dinner, sitting at the dinner table with a couple. We talking, blah, blah, blah. What do you do? I tell them what I do. The guy's looking all weird. And he says, well, do you believe that stuff? And I said, yes, it's true. I don't believe that. I said, how about this? You ever been out in the woods hog hunting? He's like, I'll go hog hunting all the time. I said, tell me about the time you were in the woods hog hunting, which I'm, I'd already noticed this happened. And I said, and the woods went quiet and you felt like somebody was watching you. And his eyes get wide. And he mm. says, yeah, that's happened a lot of times. What do you think that was? I don't know. I thought it was a predator. What kind of predator would make you feel afraid? I wasn't afraid. Yes, you were. I said, I know you were afraid. I said, because I talk to people all the time. What did the fear feel like? And next thing you know, the conversation has shifted. And I'm digging in his brain. Yeah. And he says, maybe it was something out there. I said, okay, so you suppressed whatever this was because you want to go hunting, right? He's like, yeah, well, I can't go hunting if I feel like there's something out there that's going to get me. Awesome. There's millions of people like that, that those people are the target market. When you look at the total target market for um, a show like Finding Bigfoot, of course, the Bigfoot people are the target market, the majority of the target market. But as you chunk down in that market data, it's that hunter. It's that bow hunter. It's that fisherman. It's anybody who spends time in the woods. And so the issue is, how do we present somebody to that larger audience? Because on these platforms, unfortunately, you know, these are algorithm based. So yeah. this basis is based on keywords, right? So if that person ain't typing in Bigfoot, dog man, cryptid, they not coming up. But what happens on television is you sitting there drinking a beer, clicking through the channels. And, oh, man, what's this finding Bigfoot thing? And they hit it and wham, they're into it. You know, so it's yeah. one of those things. They we're we're taking for granted as an audience. Right. Um, when it comes to, you know, higher production houses, they know, OK, these people are going to watch. It's those ancillary people, the secondary marketplace that we need yeah. to touch into. And that's um, that's why I think someone has to be elevated to a point to where um to where they can touch those ancillary markets. I, I think Tony Merkel is got, he got real close because he, he got, well, he may have already hit it. I got to talk to Tony, but you know, he did his LBL dog man thing and it went out to, to Amazon and it did pretty mm. well on Amazon. And I think, yeah. I think it starts with stuff like that. Like guys that are just regular fucking dudes that just out in the woods doing research that put together a program and sell it off and get the exposure that they need. I don't think you make a whole bunch of money putting it on Amazon, but that's not necessarily about that. If it's really a passion for you, you know, it's about getting it out there. Of course, you should make you some money, but get it out there to the public's eyes so they can see it. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, it takes it takes time and effort to put together content. So there's you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, making money off of it or you know like getting you know getting what you deserve out of what you put into it uh it, it, as far as that goes uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna make the time to do content you should get what you deserve out of it and of course that that depends on if you make good content or not right right like i'm so i'm all about dessert if you make sh bad content you shouldn't be rewarded for that you know like um, things have a funny way of balancing themselves out in our human existence here, you know? So, so I'll kind of go along with those uh, natural rules, but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, <sighs> things get out there, man. And then people, you know, it's, if you go looking for it, dude, if you take the time and effort to like really look, for people and encounters, if you put it out there, it will come back to you. Like, and I know, you know, that DW, like, Oh yeah, for sure. Um, if, if you put it out there, it will come back to you. If you're looking for people with encounters, you will find them. Um, and sometimes you'll find some really weird ones, but, uh, it, to, for me, it's, I focus on the consistency. Like I take, 
all the encounters that I'm aware of, and I just focus on the the vast majority of the consistent. You know. Yeah, I'm with you. I, it's man, I, I'm flooded with encounters. Like I haven't turned my my actual adult waters phone on. I turned it on like two weeks ago and took a bunch of phone calls and then it, it just it will not stop ringing so i turned it off because people call at two o'clock one o'clock three o'clock in the morning and there there's this expectation that you're supposed to talk to them at that time of night so i just i just turned it off but there's a plethora of encounters in that out there and what i've where i've found success and what i really really love and this is how my mind works is as you compare encounter to encounter the truth is really in the data like it's hard for a person to lie to me about their encounter because there's so many consistencies in the description of a Bigfoot. Um, and then when you so far outside the norm of what is consistently said, consistently presented, consistently described, you know a person's lying. Because it, it's like there's these outliers, right? Like if they way out on the outside, the Bigfoot was white, um, not gray, but white, like an albino, but it was in Florida. And it's like, yo, bro, none of that shit right. adds up, right? You right. Know, it's yeah, like yeah. you're lying, dog. None of that adds yeah. up. And it had, it had purple wings. Right. It's like, yo, you yeah. crazy. Like, yeah, you're bugging okay. out. You, yeah, you can kind of just throw that one out. You're like, eh. Yeah. But um, as long as they stay within, and, and it's kind of this box that I have that if you're in, inside of this box, mm -hmm. and then there's a box inside another box inside another box inside another mm -hmm. box, if you're to the center box, bro, you're 100% telling the truth. Um, because you're hitting on all cylinders and that involves emotional responses and involves the breathing. It's so many things when a person relives their encounter that you can see it, you can hear it, you can feel when they're reliving a real encounter um, as opposed to someone making up a story um, or just telling someone a story. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. and it's those things that that's what I really enjoy about doing this, man. I enjoy talking to the people um because when i talk to witnesses i get an opportunity not only to talk to them to talk to their wives i end up talking to their children and next thing you know i have a friend that's in some little small town in virginia that calls me once a month it's like hey buddy what you doing i'm like ah, i'm smoking a cigar and we'll talk for an hour and going about our business um that's been the most rewarding thing about this for me is the relationships i've been able to build with people just all over the united states frankly all over the world um and just people that were strangers you know my my wife tells me all the time. She says, "Man, you got the most stranger friends I've ever met from anybody," and it, it, that's the coolest thing about it, man. And that's that's why um, that's the reason why I appreciate you coming on and taking some time to talk. Um, because at the end of the day, it's this is more about people than it is about creatures and concepts and ideas. It's really just about people who encounter something yeah. similar, and we have these things in common. And I think if everybody got that understanding that it really is just about people and how you treat people and you treat people how you want to be treated, then everything will work out a lot better. Um, yeah. And, and I'm going to make a point of pushing that concept um, out to our community, because if we get that one part right, you know, treat people how you want to be treated, um, then, bro, I think as a whole, this genre will skyrocket. I mean, it will skyrocket to where um, people will not only just be YouTube personalities, but they will be household personalities because um, the overall audience, um, they want to see people succeed. There's two things from a political uh, consultant standpoint that I've learned. People love a success story and they love to see someone destroy themselves in the public. And that's a choice. Like you choose to be successful or you choose to destroy yourself. Like, and most people's yeah. destruction, bro, they literally destroy themselves. Somebody may push them, somebody may push them off the cliff, but by the time they got to the edge of the cliff, they done did all the work. That person just just blew on them and they yeah. fell over. And that's yeah, how exactly. it works, bro. Yep. Yep. You see it in you see it in politics all the time. And that's just that's the lesson. All right, <laughs> brother. We are up on that hour. Pat, let's do this. Tell everybody how they can find you, how they can support you. Um, tell them what they need to do to track you down and show you some love, baby. Okay, well, yeah. Hey, you can come to the YouTubes and uh, look me up on Squatch Talk. where I, uh, That's my channel, is Squatch Talk. And, uh, yeah, we have good... I try and have good campfire camaraderie discussions, which you just touched on a few minutes ago. Um, 
where it's sort of in the spirit of that. Hey, like, hey guys, we could we could sit around the campfire, we can pop open some beers, get warm, and have good discussion about all these things. Um and and be honest about it. And the show was born out of that. And so really mainly that's where I live. I, I am available. I do have some audio stuff on uh, like the major, you know, audio platforms as well. Also Squatch Talk. If you, uh, you know, Google search it or whatever. Um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, things like that. Um, I do have a presence there, but mainly right now I'm on YouTube. So. That's where you can find me. And and Squatch Talk, the Facebook group as well. Awesome sauce. Ladies and gentlemen, head on over to YouTube and look up Squatch Talk and subscribe. Now, in case you were wondering, like, oh, Doc, I don't want to look up all that, man. You're always making me look up stuff. And you're lazy. Some of y'all are lazy. Let's just admit it. During Bigfoot Weekend, which is what you're listening to right now, if you look in the description, everybody who's been a part of this weekend will see their link to their channel there so if you want to do me a favor do them a favor to really make this a success guys click every link and subscribe that you see that way the reward for their time coming over is that they actually saw something a productive fruit from being here if you don't show any productive fruit from it then people say ah oh, what the hell what's the purpose of me going over there um if nothing came out of it and that's where you play your role that's where your love and your support comes in we're growing by about a thousand subscribers a day so you guys need to get the your fingers working and moving get your fingers moving and handle your business but that being said ladies and gentlemen we are out of here and we appreciate you and we love you and have a good